This is The Meeting House with Dwight A. Moody. News, reviews, commentary, and conversation on religion and American life. Now, here is Dr. Moody. Welcome back to The Meeting House, everyone. I'm Dwight Moody, your host, coming to you from our studio in the beautiful mountains of Western North Carolina, Hendersonville, North Carolina, to be exact. We were sheltered from a great deal of the storm that swept through the country uh, last week uh, through from New Orleans all the way to New York, doing a lot of damage. And uh, but we were sheltered from it. Uh, thank God. I hope you are safe and sound uh, as well. I'm glad to be your host today for our conversation on religion and American life. We always have the news. Today, also a book review and my commentary entitled Preacher's Kids. All of that is on our website at themeetinghouse.net, but much of it will be on the show today. Uh, there's a lot of news, not only my five stories as I distribute every week, but also about the abortion laws in Texas. And, and then I have an update about The Meeting House. Uh, two weeks ago, YouTube canceled our show saying that we had violated their standards. I'm going to tell you all about that and give you an update, especially as regards our appeal of that rebuke. I'm pl I am pleased to have with me again in the meeting house to discuss all of this news, my friend and uh, a nationally known correspondent, Mr. Tom Crottenmaker. He is the public relations director for Yale Divinity School. That's his day job. But he's also has been for 15 or 16 years, I think, the religion ethics columnist for the USA Today newspaper. Tom, welcome back to the meeting house. Hello, Reverend Dr. Professor Bishop <laughs> Moody. I'm not I'm a sure bishop. I'm not a bishop in there or not, but how are you, Dwight? I'm doing good. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. And it's good to see you. You're up in New Haven, Connecticut. Did you get any of the storm? We did. Yeah, it got a little bit wet. Some uh, water crept into my apartment overnight. Buckets of rain were being just lashed against our windows. And then here at the Divinity School, there were some wet floors, but not, not enough to disrupt any of the uh, education going on here today. Boy, it was uh, Ida, I think they called that particular storm, uh, seemed to have lasted longer, gone further, and done more damage. I think I read this morning uh, that the subways in New York were shut down yesterday or this morning. Uh, transportation in New York City was, was shut down. So Yeah, and huge flooding at Newark International Airport. And sadly, there were quite a few deaths in New Jersey, people's homes being flooded. Really? It's terrible. And um, just about a week and a half ago, that's when we were supposed to have had our big hurricane that was on re and everybody was on edge for that in um, Connecticut, but that didn't amount to much. And then here's this Ida hurricane, much worse, practically no notice. Crazy. Comes all the way across the, the country. You know, it's one thing if it were to come straight out of the North Atlantic, but this this traveled all the way across the country um, and was still strong enough to disrupt things up in the, in the Northeast. That's exactly right. Uh, normally I have a guest uh, and my guest was in, scheduled to be the Reverend Dr. Kevin Cosby. He is the president of uh, Simmons College of Kentucky and HBCU and also pastor of St. Stephen's Baptist Church in Louisville. He was to be here today, but on Tuesday, two members of his family died, including his sister and his aunt. And we send our sympathies to Dr. Cosby and all of his family. Um, we're sorry that he cannot be here today, but of course, uh, he has much more important things to take care of uh, this, this week. And our prayers do go out to him and his family. We have rescheduled him for the 7th of October which is the day before their two-day conference. They call it the ADOS, the American Descendants of Slavery. This will be the third year I think they've had it. Uh, he talks about it in the book, Getting 
to the promised land. And I've read the book and have a review of it today. I'm going to talk about all of this uh, just a little bit later in the program. But first, we're going to start with our news. And Tom is here to help me analyze all this uh, news in the world of religion. He's been covering it for a long time. We're going to start out here in Los Angeles. A very interesting report released this week. Market research conducted by the guitar production company Fender demonstrates that one third of guitar sales are driven by musicians playing praise and worship in church. The same research reveals that approximately one million musicians perform weekly at their local church. Praise and worship music is rather uncommon in Europe and England, but is wildly popular in Australia and here in the United States. Two leaders in this field are Bethel Church in Southern California, also in the news earlier this week, uh, this year, over the COVID restrictions, you know, they took uh, the state of California to court. And the other Hillsong Church in Australia, also in the news, uh, reported in the meeting house because several of their leaders in New York and in Australia have gotten into legal trouble, uh, as well as professional trouble, over uh, sexual uh, abuse charges. But on the organ issue, Matt Watts of the Fender Corporation said, and I quote, we are determined to serve as a major supporter of the worship community, end quote. Tom, I want to ask you, have you ever written on the great battle between the organ and the guitar? <laughs> <laughs> I have not, but um, in the spirit of this conversation about guitars, and worship music, I'm willing to tell you a little secret about myself. Uh, tell me. That hardly anybody knows. But first, I want to make sure I have this right. I mean, I knew a lot of guitars were getting played at churches, organs too, obviously. But did you say one million musicians perform weekly at their local church? Yes, uh, playing the guitar, yeah, in praise band. That's that's a lot of guitar playing. It but, is a uh, lot it of makes sense. It makes sense now that I think about it. One third of guitar sales. Okay. Right. So now, I, I've done I, that I, myself. Tell me, what do you mean? Um, little known fact, uh, a long time ago, back in the day, as they say, I myself was a guitar player, singer, songwriter, harmonica, and I performed um, at coffee houses in and around Philadelphia, coffee houses and clubs. This was back in the 90s. And um, well, I was part of a Unitarian church back then too, Dwight. Did you and play I in often, church? <laughs> I often played. I can't at the believe this. Services. I can't reveal right here live on the meeting house the alter ego of Tom Crottenmaker. His, you know, you could be playing uh, John some John Prine. You know, uh, do you realize that? <laughs> I know you love John Prine, and uh, the kind of music I played was not totally dissimilar from that. I called it hard folk. Hard now, we, I used a different name. Now, when I played at church, they knew me as Tom Crottenmaker. Yeah. But um, I used a different name when I was performing. And uh, the name I used was Tom Holland. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember reading and seeing many years ago, it must have been back in the 90s, a major New York Times article uh, entitled, I think, The Triumph of the Guitar. And it talked about the worldwide influence of the guitar, how it had risen I think just since the uh, in uh, the development of the electric guitar. Um, and of course, this has been a matter of great consternation among many church musicians to see the piano and the organ uh, slowly replaced uh, uh, by the by the guitar. Um, but I, I, I like the guitar. I, I love the organ. I love the piano, but I love guitar playing as well. So question. You know, yeah. Which instrument would Jesus play? <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, his friends like to uh, uh, project Jesus, and I think rightly so, as an outsider, as a fringe person, not part of the uh, the music tradition in the in the temple. Long hair, kind of hippie like. I think he'd be carrying a guitar on his back, don't you? <laughs> 
<laughs> probably. Yeah, I do. Probably. I do think it's fair to, I think, note about this story. Many, many of the people who play in praise bands also play in secular bands and they're playing Friday night gigs uh, at a local club or local uh, co coffee shop and Saturday night and Sunday morning in church. So uh, many of these guitars are being used uh, on both sides of this fence, it seems to me. Yeah, and I'm you, sure that the company is happy to sell them for any purpose. Sure, I'm, I'm sure of it. News item number two from Boston. This is a fascinating story. I know you're familiar with it, Tom. Harvard University announced the appointment of Greg Epstein as president of the university's organization of chaplains. He will coordinate the activities of more than 40 chaplains representing many religions and Christian traditions. Epstein was raised Jewish, is the author of the book, Good Without God, and has been Harvard's humanist chaplain since 2005. His disappointment might work well at Harvard. Research on the graduating class of 2019 found Harvard students twice as likely to identify as atheist or agnostic than similar students in the general population. Epstein was nominated for the position by five person committee of other chaplains. Quote, we don't look to a God for answers, Mr. Epstein said. We are each other's answers, end quote. Tom, what do you make of this? Dwight, several people sent me that article because um, they knew I'd be interested. They knew of my own involvement. Sure. And humanism and the enterprise of secular meaning making. Um, sure, given the demographics at Harvard, there's nothing crazy about a humanist becoming the top chaplain. Um, I know a fair amount about um, Greg Epstein. I don't know him personally, but I would say that a thoughtful guy like him will be devoted to good chaplain support for every student there, including traditional religious believers. But you know what I want to talk about coming out of this story? Yeah, tell that me. Quote, it's that quote that you read. Yes. The idea, quote, we don't look to God for answers. We are each other's answers. Yeah. End quote. Yeah. So I'm curious what you might think of that and what listeners might think of that. You know, can we be each other's answers? Or let me put it this way. Can the answers that we give each other be any good? Can they be anywhere as good as God answers? I mean, we could talk about that all day, but what do you think of that? Well, of course, I think the answer to this is yes and yes. Uh, I think the Christian tradition certainly teaches us that other people are, are the answers to our problems often and that we are the answers to other people's prayers. You know, there is a, a famous saying about dealing with the, the people who are hungry. First, we pray and then we feed them. That's how prayer works. So uh, that touches the same thing that Mr. Epstein is trying to say. And I frequently, when I teach on the Lord's Prayer, uh, where it says, uh, give us today our daily bread, for those of us who have plenty to eat every day, I don't know that there's ever been a day in my life when I was uncertain whether there would be any food. But we are to recognize that this is a prayer that uh, millions of people around the world pray every day because they don't have any food. And it's mm -hmm. our responsibility, not necessarily to pray that prayer, but to answer the prayer for other people. And that's the same thing that Epstein is saying, don't you think? It is. But um, one reason I thought of it is that I've often heard criticisms of humanism and humanists that went like this. Oh, they worship humanity or they put all their faith in humanity and therefore they'll always be let down. And I resonate with that just a little bit. I mean, I think human beings can do bad things. They can be very disappointing individually and collectively. But I would say this, I do think human beings have the capacity, individual humans and human society, we do have the capacity to be wise, to be compassionate, to be generous, to make sure everybody has enough to eat. We don't do it all the time maybe some of the time at best. But um, well, I do think that that is a possibility and a bright possibility, human beings at our best. But I can well, also go the opposite way. 
Yes, I agree with this 100%. And I'm part of that, the Christian tradition that thinks every time there is a human act of love or generosity or courage or survival or joy, uh, these are gifts from God to every human, regardless of what their uh, religious persuasion is. Uh, and that, you know, a person may not believe in God, but as a believer in God, I think every ounce of joy, every expression of love in that person's house, uh, life is indeed a gift from God. Mm. Uh, and of course, you've written about all of this stuff, Tom, your book, uh, Confessions of a Secular Jesus Follower. I, I interviewed you when that book came out a few years ago. Uh, so you've given this a lot of thought over a long, long period of time. You know what was striking to me? The headlines emphasize that Greg Epstein is an Epstein is an atheist, and they did that for a dramatic effect, right? Sure, but sure. That answers only the tiniest part it of does. the question. So that's what, in a way, atheist tells you what he's not. So he's not a God believer, but what he is is a humanist, and yes. he's working really hard to bring goodness and meaning forward yeah. in a secular way. So that's the. Um, impressive thing about him. And I see the secular movement gradually pivoting away from what it doesn't believe toward what it does believe in, this positive articulation of secular life. Well, you know what I think? I think Greg Epstein needs to pay a visit to the meeting house some week, don't you? <laughs> That's a really good idea. I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to you having him on. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. And I'll make sure it's uh, sometime when you're here helping me with the news. <laughs> that would be great. From Chicago, the Christianity Today podcast, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, recently featured a discussion of the evangelical movement. This is the trend of those leaving evangelical congregations for other forms of Christian faith or for no faith at all. Usage of the hashtag, hashtag evangelical, has been growing since 2016, now garnering more than 300 million views on TikTok, 54,000 posts on Instagram, and routinely getting more than 100,000 daily impressions on Twitter. In recent years, cultures, communities, and followings have grown up around hashtags such as hashtag empty pews, hashtag church two, hashtag slate speak, hashtag decolonize, hashtag ex-Christian, hashtag ex-Mormon, as well as the hashtag ex-evangelical. All of them are dedicated to talking about what it is like to grow up in a faith and leave it. Ex-evangelical. You familiar with that term, Tom? I am. I have been hearing that. You know, you were giving some big numbers. I'm going to talk about some numbers, too, that relate to the story you were telling. Okay. But these are numbers that are going down, and it's related. So let's talk about the percentage of the U.S. public that is identifies as white evangelical. Um, as recently as 2006, I looked up some of these data before we started yeah. this conversation because I knew you were going to bring it up, Dwight. As recently as 06, 23% of the U.S. population identified as white and evangelical. Right. Now that number is 14.5%. Yes. So it's gone down from 23 to 14.5. This new figure comes from very recent data from Public Religion Research Institute. And this is something that caught my eye. Now, according to these data anyway, white evangelicals are a smaller percentage of the public than white mainline Protestants. Yes. As a matter you know, of fact, the, um, the softies like the Episcopalians <laughs> saying that facetiously. And think about that, Dwight, because um, no, for years I was hearing from evangelicals that it's the evangelical churches that are the ones that are growing while, you know, those liberals are declining and dwindling in number. That's the evangelicals with their stout theology and resisting cultural trends. They were strong and they were the future. And look where we are now. Yes, um, there was a very famous book written, Why Conservative Churches Are Growing. That must have been back in the 80s. And the, the very statistics you quoted 
also not only demonstrate that the mainline Protestants have quit declining, the last two years there, they have inched upward. Something uh, of a rebound, yeah. It, it is. It's a, a rebound. It's too early to tell whether it will be a trend. But certainly uh, this other, the decline of white evangelicals is a strong trim, uh, trend. I reported two months ago that Southern Baptists have lost two million members since 2006. Wow. And this, um, the future of white evangelicalism looks even more daunting if you look at the age demographics. And um, I tracked this down too, just before we started talking. Um, well, 22% of Americans who are 65 and over are white evangelicals. The number is just 7% yeah. for those who are between 18 yeah. and, and 29. And so if you extrapolate, you can see where that's heading. Sure, some of them may go back to the church or join the church, but not in the numbers that would come even close to catching up with the numbers that um, white evangelicals joined like in the 80s and 90s. It It's going to be fascinating uh, for people to track this into the future. I don't know who's projecting things. It's hard to project religion. Who would have imagined uh, the rise of uh, radical Islam in 1950? You know, it, it grows, I've done some shows on this and it grows out of a certain uh, series of books, but uh, you know, it's hard to um, count religion out uh, and to predict what will happen uh, with the world's religions. Uh, but anyway, this is, a, this is a fascinating development. And I do want to go back and explain something in this story. Christianity Today, of course, one of the largest publishers of white evangelical material. They do this podcast, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, which was a church mm -hmm. out in Seattle. It's one of a number of large white megachurches that has uh, been very uh, traumatized over the last four or five years. Uh, I could have uh, written about another one uh, that's going through trauma. I know I did uh, last week. I had two of them. And so this is a podcast about what happened out at this Mars Hill church, and which is now which went under. The, the church went totally under. Mm -hmm. um, as a result of this, but um, uh, yeah, as a white evangelical, most of my life, I think I'm I am part of this ex ex evangelical movement. Uh, I'm like many many people, very resistant to calling myself an evangelical again, but I certainly grew up that way. Now from Washington, D.C. This is an interesting story. Uh, close to home with you, uh, Tom. Pastor Daniel Darling appeared on the cable news show Morning Joe to talk about his decision to get vaccinated. You would, wouldn't think that would be complicated or controversial. He had published these thoughts in a column for USA Today newspaper. But because Darling was also on the payroll of the National Religious Broadcaster, his comments got him into trouble, so much trouble, he got fired. The organization's leadership determined that his comments violated their policy of remaining neutral about COVID vaccines. Darling will continue to host his podcast, The Way Home. Well, did you read Darling's column when it came out in the, in the paper? I heard all about this. Um, my comment will start with just a practical reality. If you're a communications person for an organization and you say something publicly that goes against that organization, then yeah, you're gonna be in hot water. I don't know if you should have been fired, but that's kind of a no-no when you're doing communications, right? Because oh, you, way, you're correct that it did hit home for me because yeah, you don't say today and the fact that I write for them and that I do it on the side and that I'm gainfully employed by another organization. And you are their communication person. And I am their communications director, right. And, and you, you have to be I am careful. very, very careful not to mix up my agenda with right. my employer's agenda. And when I'm in my working day, it's not my agenda that I'm advancing and it's not me I'm speaking for. Right. Um, okay, but here's the other thing. Why would it even be an issue? Why yes. would 
any organization <laughs> be maintaining a stance of neutrality when it comes to COVID vaccinations? Well, you know that this these religious broadcasters represent all the televangelists and all the white and black and Hispanic evangelicals out there. They're the ones that are uh, on, on the air and they're the ones that are members of this organization. And uh, what would come natural to you and me, these people are trying to stay in good graces with their constituency. Exactly. Well, and when I it, asked that question, I meant it rhetorically. Yes, I know. And they're so afraid of they angering are. this um, riled up base. And they do so much to pander to it. It's kind of astonishing. It's it is astonishing. Yes, but it's and, an example of cancel culture, isn't it? For him to get fired? Yeah, it definitely is. I'm looking at this other headline right now, your religion news service. After Dan Darling, truthful evangelicals look unemployable. And it's not far from that to what we see with Republicans and the so-called uh, big lie of the election. If you're a Republican in good standing right now, you are not supposed to point out that there really wasn't any widespread cheating or rigging in the election. You're not supposed to point out that Joe Biden won. You're not supposed to point out that there's no evidence right. for the claims of Trump and others that there was cheating or the election was stolen. There's a whole range of things that you're not supposed to say. Man, talk about political correctness. But and you know, uh, religion, itself has a long tra tradition of silencing people. Uh, you know, Galileo, of course, one of the most famous, but it goes back to, to Jeremiah, Jesus himself. Uh, and of course, in our day, many Protestant and Catholic writers, theologians, artists have been silenced or excommunicated. Uh, you, mm -hmm. you know, if you say that, you, you won't, we won't give you communion. Uh, so it, this is not just a conservative white evangelical thing. It runs across the board uh, in in religious circles. Um, and really across society, especially when it does. it's so polarized right now, politically now, and culturally. In a few minutes, uh, I'm going to bring everybody up to date on the cancel culture episode we've had here at the Meeting House uh, in our dealings with YouTube. I'll come back to that in just a minute. From Atlanta, Baptist meeting virtually for the second consecutive year heard a call to open their hearts and homes to refugees from Afghanistan. Rick Sample of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, which is my own ecclesial home, made the appeal joining other religious leaders around the country in emphasizing the need for hospitality. hospitality. It is estimated that as many as 65,000 Afghans were airlifted out of the country. While they will be resettled in many countries around the world, it is likely the refugees now escaping the Taliban takeover will be placed in cities already home to Afghan populations, such as in the United States, San Francisco. At least 132,000 foreign-born Afghan immigrants were living in the United States as of 2019, according to the American Community Survey. Have you written a, a, anything about this this immigration issue? Well, you're the one who's been writing about it and speaking about it so forcefully. <laughs> and apparently people are listening to you because I've been seeing headlines about the way that church communities are rallying like across the board. Across the board, yes. And uh, I'm, so ha I'm so happy to see that. I am too. I've mentioned this more than once to the little congregation here in North Carolina where I preach each Sunday. But I think it's... Uh, it, it is it is needed so much, not only across the southern border, like it used to be uh, in New York as folks were coming in through Ellis Island, but uh, we need to receive these Afghan people and make them feel at home uh, in the United States. I believe it very, very strongly. And hospitality, not just from Christian groups, but humanist groups and uh uh, you know, social groups and all religious groups need to need to practice this virtue of hospitality. I agree. Um, it's a beautiful thing. 
you and I spoke on the phone when I was trying to process all the criticism that uh, Biden was getting mm -hmm. about the way things went down in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And um, I get it. I mean, he's not above criticism. That did not go well. It's not wrong or surprising that the administration has taken so much flack about the way it went. I mean, I would prefer that it be placed in context and that we look at the tough situation that he was put in. But it's so much healthier to focus on what we can do about it going forward. And it's so good for churches and other communities of meaning to focus on what they can do, what we can do to serve people. And you phrase it just right when you talk about hospitality. And that's something that people across the board, theologically, politically, different right. philosophies. I think it's something that we'd all believe in and all value. Well, it's you, a great way to put it forward right now for the good of, you know, Afghans. But I'd like to see it applied more widely, too. Well, in the famous parable that Jesus told, uh, recorded in the 25th chapter of Matthew, that we quote often, I was... Uh, I was naked and you clothed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink includes this line. I was a stranger and you took me in. And this is, of course, uh, one of the key places, at least in the Christian uh, tradition, where uh, hospitality has its Christian roots, uh, its roots in the life of, of Jesus. It's frequently noted that uh, Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus had to flee to Egypt where they were refugees uh, after having no home uh, in uh, Bethlehem, as the story goes, uh, no room in the inn, so they were born in a major. So this whole Jesus tradition is one of uh, being a stranger and welcoming strangers. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so uh, I do want to uh, bring people up to date. Two weeks yeah. ago, I did a story about uh, Pentecostal preachers traveling around the country uh, preaching, and I have to be very careful how I say this, about the vaccine, because uh, an algorithm on YouTube uh, uh, evidently was automatically translating what I was saying, and when I quoted what these preachers were saying, which, which was negative about the vaccine, mm -hmm. it interpreted it as if I was saying the same thing. We got a notice from YouTube saying that they were cutting off our program and not putting it back up because we had violated their standards about the vaccine information. All of this was, I'm sure, done with an algorithm. There was nobody listening down there, uh, to, uh, I don't think, to my show. Uh, uh, we appealed their decision, uh, trying to explain who we were and what we were doing. Among other things, uh, you listen to me. Every week, I tell people to get vaccinated. Uh, I say, be kind, do justice, get vaccinated. This is part of the mantra that I have. We made an appeal. They they denied our appeal, which we think also uh, was not done by any human person, but, but uh, simply an algorithm. Uh, but this is an example of cancel culture that hit home to us. And they told us if this happens again, we'll have strike two and we will be on their uh, watch list. This has already, even in the way I tell the story today, put a damper on what I'm able to say on this program. Wow, algorithms. Yes. A poorly written algorithm made the mistake in the first place. And then I was going to ask you if an algorithm was going to hear your appeal. But you just said that the appeal already happened and you think an algorithm yeah. heard the appeal and of course made the predictable dumb decision. Yeah. That's, that's so that's, frustrating. It is frustrating. And of course there's, this is why uh, millions of people around the country are angry at Facebook and at um, uh, YouTube and all of these and Google because they do control what we say. And here is an innocent example of this.
innocent. I mean, this is the most wholesome, wholesome show that I know <laughs> and the most consistent about preaching uh, public health. Yes. As well as the other gospel, very yes. responsibly. And so, as I said a minute ago, it's incredibly um, frustrating and it's stupid. This uh, reminds me why so many people are afraid of um, artificial intelligence. I mean, if algorithms and code are making decisions like this, and it becomes a bigger and bigger part of our lives, man, we're doomed. Who knows uh, where it will end? And I hope in the weeks ahead to cover not only our little piece of this story, but the wider story. It makes me wonder whether other religious leaders are being silenced or uh, tapped down or challenged uh, by these algorithms. Um, and I'm sure this is part of the grassroots frustration that is coming up to Congress as Congress makes uh, threatening noises about uh, busting up these companies and uh, uh, regulating the companies because of this type of thing. Anyway, yeah, I hope something. I hope something gets done because a lot of bad things are happening and frustration is mounting. Tom, thank you for being with me in the meeting house today for doing this uh, ev evaluation of the news. Tom is going to be my co-host for the news portion of the meeting house on the first Thursday of each month for the rest of this year. We're going to test this out. Tom, you're great and appreciate you coming on. I hope you have a dry and safe weekend. God bless you. You too. Thanks for having me on and take care. All right. I'll be back in a minute with some thoughts about Kevin Cosby and reparations. I'm Dwight Moody in the Meeting House. We finished the news with Tom Krottenmacher. My scheduled guest for the day was my friend, Kevin Cosby, the president of Simmons College of Kentucky and HBCU in Louisville and pastor of the St. Stephen Baptist Church also in Louisville. It is through their live television network that this show is broadcast on YouTube and Facebook. And if you're watching it today, we have St. Stephen's to thank for that. But on Tuesday of this week, two members of his family, his sister and his aunt passed away. I do not know any more details about it. I don't know whether these deaths were COVID related uh, and whether they were expected or unexpected. But part of my interest in having Dr. Cosby on the show has to do with his new book, Getting to the Promised Land. It has a subtext or a subtitle, Black America and the Unfinished Work of the Civil Rights Movement. I've read this book and I'm telling you, I'm fascinated by this book. I suggest that this is an excellent book for uh, churches all over the country to read in small groups. It's very readable. It is it has 10 chapters in it. They are short chapters. There's only about 100 pages in the book. But it is a fascinating reinterpretation of a good part of the book because this is what he does. He says it's time for the civil rights movement to move past the Exodus event as the primary biblical motif inspiring the work of civil rights and look to the exile and the return from exile, a story that's told in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in the Hebrew Bible, to look to that event as a guideline for what it means to get to the promised land or to finish the business of civil rights. Who would ever think to use Ezra and Nehemiah to promote reparations for the black community? That's the question I have. It's what I wanted to ask Dr. Cosby uh, when he was going to be on the show. I will ask him that when he, uh, when he comes on the 7th of October. 
I know he'll have a clear answer, a decisive explanation, because Dr. Cosby is as intelligent, educated, and articulate a man as I know. He's also very convincing. He's very persuasive. I know many of you who listen to him week by week can say amen to that. I think he's working on a PhD degree. He's a lifelong learner of the best sort and a model for me and you on that. Dr. Cosby is the, a leading public advocate for the cause of a group known as American Descendants of Slavery, or ADOS. ADOS. This book is about that group. He segregates this demographic from the black population in general, and even more so from what we now call people of color which generally includes people who have a Latino background or an Asian background as well as African. But Dr. Cosby's focus in this book is clearly and narrowly on the group whose ancestors were brought over to America to be slaves and who worked in the United States as slaves up until the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1863. They've been denied their civil rights, and restitution, even as the country has moved in that painfully slow uh, process of giving them freedom, autonomy, and opportunity. This ADOS demographic, American Descendants of Slavery, has never recovered economically and socially from their enslavement. That's the core issue. I can't how, imagine how anyone would contest this claim, although he really doesn't uh, demonstrate it with statistics. I'm sure other people have. He likewise never acknowledges that uh, some in this demographic have overcome slavery and discrimination to achieve remarkable things, financial and, and otherwise. Nevertheless, Cosby reiterates the point throughout that ADOS needs to keep their specific identity before them and not allow their continued claims for economic justice to be subsumed under the broader appeal of a larger racial or color group. This is a very powerful point he is trying to make. He connects this with Ezra's rejection of intermarriage. If you've read the book of Ezra, you know, when he came back from Babylon and found that the Jews who had retu returned earlier from their uh, exile in Babylon had intermarried. And this compromised what God wanted to do in and through their specific group. I found this approach to ethnic purity to be one of the more complicated elements of his argument because normally we are, there's so much uh, the practice of intermarriage between all kinds of groups has led us to uh, break down barriers between ethnic groups uh, all around the world. But what Cosby does with great skill is to reread the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in the Bible and find a paradigm for ADOS activism. Yes, he talks about Martin Luther King, and yes, he quotes James Cone, the great black theologian. But he's calling for the nation, not, not only the descendants of slavery, but all of us to move past the more famous Bible story of the Exodus and reread Ezra and Nehemiah with this in mind. The Jewish people were taken into exile in 586 BC by the Babylonians, and they came back from exile beginning in 537 and lasting for about a century. Cosby's book, I want to say, is an exposition of these two books of the Bible. Now, I'm a preacher. I see throughout this book the signs, what we call homiletic signs, homiletic marks, leading me to believe that before these things were in print in a book for you and me, they were sermons that he preached to the good people of St. Stephen's Church. Well, if that's the case, 
Those people are fortunate indeed because they've been blessed with creative, faithful, and powerful teaching. The kind that binds their lived experience with the narrative of the Bible. What more could a people ask for? I wish I could do that as well as he did it in this book. Dr. Cosby describes the Babylonian strategy of exile, removing the leadership of the Jewish people from their home in Judea and Jerusalem to some foreign destination in the realm. He describes then the, the decision by the Persian authorities to release these exiles to go home. He points out that the decision was accompanied by provisions sufficient to reestablish the Jewish state and capital. Cosby, Cosby calls these provisions reparations and asserts that, quote, there is no justice without reparations. And then he quotes a number of biblical texts, including my favorite Jesus story. The story of Zacchaeus, who when he got converted, stood up and said, I'm going to make restitution and give people four times what I took from them. That's what we call reparations. Cosby connects this story, the ADOS story, not only to the biblical narrative, but also the Supreme Court ruling Plessy versus Ferguson of 1896. And this was an interesting twist on that. He connects it to the Hart Cellar Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965, to the building of the new YMCA in West Louisville, to the 1968 movie Planet of the Apes, to three television sitcoms in the late 20th century, and finally to the kneeling of the San Francisco quarterback Colin Kaepernick. In other words, this book is a tour de force, not only of the biblical narrative, but also of our own American history and culture. It helps to be an alert, educated person when you're reading this book and when you're sitting in a pew listening to Dr. Cosby preach. Thank you, Kevin, for this masterful exposition of scripture and history and applying it fearlessly to the situation in which we find ourselves today, seeking to do justice and love mercy in a spirit of humility before God. God bless you, Kevin, not only for the book and your leadership in Louisville, but as you minister to your family this week, may your words and your presence be a great comfort to them in this time of loss and grief. I'm Dwight Moody in the Meeting House. I'll be back in just a minute. I'm Dwight Moody in the Meeting House with my commentary for the week entitled Preacher's Kids. I was one and glad for it, but many others, not so much. Take Abraham Piper, for example. His father is the famous and influential pastor, John Piper, pastor for 33 years of the Bethlehem Baptist Church of Minneapolis. He's a leading advocate for what is known as the young, restless, and reformed. It's a powerful subculture within white evangelical Christianity. His books are widely read, very, very popular among a certain subset of American Christianity. But his boy, Abraham, rebelled against the strict religious code of his father's house and his father's church. He's a young adult now, but earlier, as he was just entering young adulthood, he was excommunicated from the church. And then he was restored in a very emotional ceremony full of high hopes, but then kicked out again. 
He just couldn't believe what they wanted. He couldn't behave in the way they wanted. So he couldn't belong in the way that he had. He launched a successful social media career, which included beginning last year, a series of videos criticizing the faith of his father, making fun of it, in fact. Advice like lighten up, get laid and go bowling earned him a million followers in short order. Not all PKs subject their parents to this sort of embarrassment and pain. Many embrace the faith and take up ministerial careers themselves. In fact, history demonstrates that the children of ministers succeed in life at rates higher than the average. If we define, quote, succeed in life as obeying the rules, finding a career, and contributing to society, that may or may not constitute success. The Barna Research Group publishes data, and they published data in 2012 demonstrating that preachers' kids continue in the faith of their fathers and mothers at about the same rate as other kids. I'm sure that's what one young pastor is hoping when she posted this week a picture of her firstborn child. It came with this tagline, quote, introducing the newest card-carrying member of the pastor's kids club, end quote. I know this pastor. She has reason for optimism about her own child, if her own PK journey is any measure. When I turn to my own family, there are four of us who grew up under the watch care of Tom and Rita Moody. They were both ministers. He was ordained and employed by church. She was a chaplain and a therapist long before women could be ordained or be recognized as reverends. Two of the four children, including me, went into formal ministry. But the four of us represent today a wide spectrum of connection to church as we enter into the social security stage of life. We've grown close in the years since our devout parents died. And perhaps time, it's time that we, the four of us, preacher's kids, took up this matter in our conversation. That conversation could roll over into the lives and times of our children. There are 13 grandchildren of Tom and Rita. Two of them are ordained ministers, one of whom is married to an ordained minister. My own three children have tasted the full fare of their generation, from education to addiction, including marriage and divorce, success and failure, inspiration and incarnation, and mental illness. Whether any of that can be traced back to their ministerial father is hard to say, but I'll tell you, I think about it a lot. I know the stories of many other ministers and their wayward kids, starting with the notorious outlaw, Jesse James. His father was a prominent Baptist minister in both Kentucky and Missouri. As a matter of fact, if you go to the James family farm, just outside of Kansas City, Missouri, there in the museum behind a glass case is the college diploma from Georgetown College in Kentucky, a Baptist school from which I graduated in 1972. Some preacher's kids follow short-lived journeys into sin and sadness. Others embrace long-term rejection of the faith of their fathers and mothers while flourishing in other ways. Still others spend a lifetime in jail or die young, often in tragic ways. The biblical story of David and Absalom speaks to all parents, not just the preacher kind. David was, you know, the Bible says, a man after God's own heart. But his most gifted son, Absalom, had a mind of his own. And his rebellious spirit turned into open warfare against his father. Danger ensued. David pled with his own soldiers to spare the life of his son, Absalom. 
But when David learned of his son's death, he slowly mounted the stairs to his private quarters, muttering, according to the Bible, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you. O oh, Absalom, my son. It's the saddest story in the Bible. One that has been repeated many times to those who speak from the pulpit and to those who listen from the pews. Life is full of sadness, isn't it? I have spoken to three parents this week whose children will not speak to them. I love my three children and I'm so very proud to be their father. I admire their resilience. I treasure their friendship. I celebrate their success. I pray for their happiness. I adore their children and just wish there were more of them. I pray their status as preacher's kids has been a blessing and not a curse. A gateway into faith, hope, and love. And a gift for which they are thankful today. May it be so. I'm Dwight Moody in the Meeting House. I'll be back in just a minute. Thank you for joining us today in the Meeting House. That's the familiar Meeting House music, a selection from the symphony Appalachian Spring by Aaron Copeland. The tune, of course, is the familiar Shaker tune, uh, Simple Gifts, and we play it every week. Thanks to my co-host today, Tom Crottenmaker. He did a great job. I look forward to him, to him coming back in October. I look forward to Kevin Cosby being on the show October the 7th. Next week, my guest is Diana Butler Bass and her wonderful book, Freeing Jesus. You won't want to miss it. Thank you for listening on YouTube or Facebook Live or by radio or as a podcast. By this time tomorrow, this show will be up as a podcast on our podcast page. You can go to themeetinghouse.net slash podcast. There are scores of podcasts with interesting people. You can listen anytime you want. Thank you for your interest in The Meeting House. Let me hear from you. Send me a text. Give me a call. Send me an email. Go to the, the website at themeetinghouse.net. At the bottom of every page, there's a response form, and you can write me anything you want. Recommend a book, a guest, correct me, something I've said, take issue with me, or just thank me for trying to maintain civil discourse on religion and American life. You can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter. It's free. It'll come to your house about 8 o'clock every Wednesday night, Eastern Standard Time. Until next week, be safe, do justice, love mercy, get the vaccine. Pray for the soul of America. Be kind to everyone. Give thanks. God bless you. I'm Dwight Moody in the Meeting House. Have a great day. been in the meeting house with host Dwight A. Moody. Thank you for watching or listening today. Visit our website at themeetinghouse.net for more news, reviews, commentaries, and conversation on religion and American life.